Good evening, everyone. Magandang gabi po sa lahat. My name is Kate. I am a former professor turned researcher, and now I identify as an academic practitioner because I now work with migrant groups, especially Filipino migrants here in Europe. And at the same time, I'm still working on my research projects. I'm here this morning, my time and evening, your time, to talk about the fundamentals of social science research. I know that uh, some listeners already know this topic and might just want to brush up. Some of you are completely unfamiliar and would like to know the basics. And I know as well that some are students who need a bit of support with their current work. Either way, I will do my best today to make sure that everything is clear and understandable. And I've linked further reading materials in this PowerPoint, uh, which can be shared with you afterwards. So I will be presenting mostly in English, but for any questions, please feel free. Nagtatagalog naman po ako. Kahit Taglish, Ikulano, Bisaya, just ask and I will answer them. Um, I wanted to show you an overview of today's session so that you know what we are getting into uh, in this roughly one hour session for the PCPD. So I know that for many people, research is a scary word. I'm not sure what it is about research that overwhelms so many of us, but it's definitely a thing that I've heard a number of times uh, long ago from my students when I was teaching at the University of the Philippines. And even now from colleagues uh, who are often uncomfortable at the thought of having to do this thing called research. Uh, nakakapanghinayang because research really isn't that scary. Not if you find the right topic that calls to you. And knowing that the purpose isn't to impress anyone, but to build knowledge and to share knowledge. And this is especially important from first-line practitioners. And by this, I mean uh, our teachers, social workers, police officers, psychologists, health workers, community and religious leaders, and so forth. I say this because uh, who knows more about how students engage in a classroom than a teacher who spends 40 to 50 hours a week in the classroom with them? And uh, who knows more about the difficulties that our homeless elderly people face than our community workers and social workers who are in daily contact with them. I can say this um, because I worked at and I'm still affiliated with universities. I know what academics don't know and cannot access. And I know what practitioners know and can share with the academic and policy community. And I strongly believe that we should be working together, helping each other, and sharing research. So knowing this, today's session will be roughly one hour uh, following the PCPD seminar series, and it will be quite tight. Um, as you can see in the PowerPoint, uh, we are starting now with the overview. Following this, we will do an introduction to research. What is research? Uh, why should we do it? Uh, following this, an overview of the research process. How does it go normally? And after that, we will have three core sections, theories. What are theories in the concept, uh, in the context of research? Uh, methodologies, how do methodologies work in this field? And what do we do once we have both? We have the data and then we go to analysis. Uh, the end of this session, we'll look at the ethical considerations, especially in social science research. And finally, we will end the session with communication and dissemination. I would like to invite all of you to just feel free to ask questions as the session goes so that uh, they're fresh in your mind. And I will do my best to answer them um, immediately after this session. So let's um, begin. So research, what is research? So very, very briefly, um, I would say that research is the process of solving problems and finding facts in an organized way. This is very important. Research is done by using what is known, if anything is known, and building on it. And additional knowledge can be developed by proving or falsifying existing theories from previous research and by trying to explain uh, observations better. For me, uh, research is taking what we can see, hear, feel, imagine, and turning it into knowledge and sharing it with people who can use it to make the world a better place. 
So why do we do research? My answer here is to join the global conversation and contribute to human knowledge. It sounds really grandiose, but uh, bear with me here. We are all brilliant and we all have our own unique insights and our own professional capacities. How I think is likely not the same as how you think. And presented with the same information, the same data, maybe we wouldn't have the same way of analyzing it, or maybe we wouldn't have the same conclusions. And this is great. Other people might not have the same interpretations either, but then when we share our research, we share our different angles or different viewpoints, then we join into a global conversation, the same conversation, and maybe we can each uh, share something that the other person didn't know that would help them develop further findings or help them improve in their own work. Now, I will give very, very practical examples later, but to bear with me for this first theoretical process. In the end, with research, you should have something that you are really excited about, which surprises you or others. What I mean by this is which pushes the boundaries and which gives you convincing answers to the two questions that are always asked for research. Why? Uh, why are you doing it? Why should people care about the research? And is it new? What are you contributing to the conversation? So today at each step of the process, I will be giving concrete examples to best illustrate each concept. Um, before going to the overview of the research process, I just wanted to point out this uh, beautiful infographic. And uh, basically it shows you a linear diagram of a research process starting from conception all the way to theorizing, data gathering, analysis, and uh, the end of the process. Uh, this is very beautiful and colorful, but actually in reality the research process is a bit more complex and um, I found this image which makes more sense to me because honestly uh, unless uh, you have a brilliant, brilliant mind that you can just go straight through the entire research process without ever doubting yourself or without ever going back and asking, uh, did I do it? Should I have thought about it? Did somebody else do it and I didn't realize? It's more like this. So you think about it, you start doing it, you realize that you forgot to think about something, you go back and do a bit more research, you write a bit more, you think, oh, that's actually a good idea, I should have included it in my concept, you go back again, and then you go forward, and eventually, hopefully, we reach the end. So just to say that this is very, very normal. This is my research process as well. And just don't be discouraged if when you start doing research or if you have already done research and not finished it or you're still in the process that it isn't like the beautiful linear drawing and it's more like this complex maze. This is fine. Just, just keep moving forward and we will get there in the end. So overview of the research process. Just to clarify that today we will be talking about the first box, how to design a research and everything else, how to execute it, um, analyze, synthesize and share. We will touch on a little bit as well today, but these are completely separate processes. So when we design a research, this is uh, the conceptualization. What is the problem? Um, what is your theory, your hypothesis about what it might be? And um, what is the background? Has anyone done anything on this study? Has anyone done any um, either theoretical or empirical research, either directly on your topic or maybe on a related topic that could work for your research? How do you think you want to do it? How long do you think you want to do it? Do you have any money for doing it? That's also an important consideration. And uh, what support do you need to do it? Um, do you need a supervisor? Do you need a laboratory? Do you need assistants, translators, and so forth? So everything uh, along those lines is the design phase. Following this is executing the research. And depending on your design, this can take anywhere from a few days to a few years. Uh, <laughs> Following this, once you have all of your data gathered, you will enter into an analysis phase where you will get the data that you have and find the linkages um, 
find the knowledge that is in that data that you can share with the community. Following this, you will write down what you have done in your research, uh, usually in a scientific journal, but we will discuss more of this later because that is not the only way that you can share your research. And the end point is indeed sharing your research. I, I don't want to spend too much on the research process because this is an entirely different seminar. But I've added here on the side some useful links on how to conduct research. Now, these are links that I have looked at and verified myself and that I recommend to my own students. So they are the, the first line links and within them you will find links to even more complicated ways of how to describe research. So I highly recommend uh, clicking on either of these four. Uh, you will also see the last of the four is actually a textbook and it is extremely comprehensive and I, I do recommend that one. It, all of them are free, so please feel free to click on them to learn more about the research process. And now we begin. The first step and the most, uh, I don't want to say the most important, but the most often forgotten step I would say in research is regarding theory. So I, I want to start today with discussing theories. What are theories and why are they important in research? So I, I put it here and I really want to emphasize that theory is important because it gives you the actual foundation to what you're doing. Without knowing what has been done before, who has thought about what, your research is an island and it's standing alone. And this is not a good place to be when you are doing research. You really need to know the foundational background to be able to know how you should move forward and if you should move forward, if it has already been done. Uh, maybe you don't need to repeat it. Maybe you can think of a variant. And on the second bullet point, I mentioned join the conversation. And this is a point that really, really sticks with me because I believe that this entire process is a global conversation. We are all sharing our insights. We're all sharing our knowledge. And it's not just the people who are doing research now, but those who have done it 10, 20, 100, 200 years ago, whose research is available. We can read it. We can see what they thought and what they did. We can look at what people have done after that. And then we join with our own contribution. And in, in a year, two years, five years after this, uh, your students and your colleagues and uh, future researchers will be able to see your research. And then they will be able to contribute their own. So it's something that is it's permanent and it doesn't end. And I just think that it's beautiful. And uh, this is also why I'm very, very passionate about research and that I believe that everybody should be doing it and should be sharing it. Uh, this brings me back to theories. I realize that I have not defined what is a theory. And um, in layman's terms, let's just say that a theory is something that shapes the way we think. And we might not even know that there is something shaping the way we think until we start Googling it. Uh, I want to give you a very, very concrete example. So uh, let's take an example from international relations and let's take something uh, relatively well known uh, like nuclear weapons. You might be following the recent developments uh, regarding nuclear weapons across the world. And you might know that uh, in terms of quantity, uh, there is an estimated 500 British nuclear weapons in the world versus we really don't know about the status of North Korean nuclear weapons, but let's say that there are less than a dozen. But you might be more afraid of the less than a dozen North Korean nuclear weapons than the hundreds of British or American nuclear weapons that they have in the stockpile. And this is an interesting question. Because in international relations theory, this would mean that you are more of a constructivist. Um, basically, you would see the world and what we know about the world as socially constructed versus, for example, if you were a realist, in which case 500 nuclear weapons is a lot more than a dozen or a handful. 
you as a realist would go more with quantity and real on the ground situation than something that we, we construct in our head. Whereas constructivism, the approach would be more of, well, the US and the UK are quote unquote friendly countries, if this is what you believe, whereas North Korea could be a bit more unstable. And then this is why in your mind, you think that this situation is more dangerous than the other versus somebody who is a realist might look at you and ask, no, no, that isn't the case. You just need to look at the numbers. And uh, then you might have other theorists who just look at you both and think you're looking at this all wrong. We shouldn't even be thinking about this. This is super old. We need to look more at soft power. We need to start looking at uh, how uh, cybercrime and how open source data are affecting international relations. And these are just all different points of view. Right? You have your own and everybody else has their own. And it's important that we are aware of our own theoretical foundations. Because when it comes to research, you will be bringing your own theoretical foundations and you need to know where you fit in in this conversation. And um, I have a question here on the other side of uh, my PowerPoint and the question that I hear quite a lot as well. Can I do research without theory? And the answer is no. No, you cannot do research without having your theoretical foundations. There are many consequences to this. Uh, the first one is just not knowing where you are in the literature, you're, you're lost. You don't know which conversation you are joining. Um, are, are you joining, for example, the discussion of uh, the anthropological scholars, sociological scholars, philosophical scholars? If you're citing, I hope, <laughs> citation is happening if different people from different fields are being cited who are not actually talking to each other but talking about completely different things using the same word then then you're lost and your reader will not be able to know what exactly you are replying to another risk is that you repeat research that has already been done maybe it was proven right Maybe it was proven wrong, but if it's already been done, it's not really a new contribution to the knowledge here. A uh, worse conclusion is drawing a conclusion without any foundation. Without the theoretical foundation, you will have data, but that data will not mean anything. It will just be quantitative. So you really need to have your theoretical foundation solidly grounded. And here, um, an even worse possibility is creating a faulty research project based on only assumptions. This is your time, uh, your energy, and probably your money that is pouring into this research. So it's important that it's very foundation, the concept, the intellectual concept is solid. So I promised concrete examples, and I will give two examples here regarding the importance of theory in research. So an example one, let's say that you want to do research on the leading cause of why students are late to their morning class in the morning. And uh, you narrow it down. You want to only look at grade eight students. You want to only look at students from the national capital region. And you just want to know why are they late to their first class in the morning? Okay, good. You don't do your theoretical background, but rather you think, I want to do a survey. So you identify your method immediately. And in your survey, you ask the questions related to mornings, because this is your area of interest. So you ask, where do they live? What time do they wake up in the morning? What do they do in the morning? Do they commute? Are their parents bringing them to school? What time is their first class? And so on. You make a very detailed survey. And then at the end of the survey, let's say uh, you were very, very successful and you interviewed 800 students from the National Capital Region. Fantastic. At the end of the survey, you collate all your data. And of course, they have different responses. Some live further, some live nearer, some commute, some have private drivers, some walk. Uh, but the most common thing that you see in your research is that all of the students ate rice in the morning. You ask them about their morning routine and they, they very, very gamely describe their morning routine. And they said that they all ate rice. Rice with longanisa, rice with beef tapa, rice with tocino. I'm hungry. It's lunchtime for me. But 
Yes, a rice. So what happens at the end of this research is that you conclude that hmm, rice is the reason why students are late to their class for their first class in the morning. And uh, you might be laughing, but you know, without a theoretical foundation, this, this, this might be the case. Um, and this is simply a research that does not pass standards. The research question is good, a survey method would be good, but without the theoretical foundation, what are you looking for exactly? Are you looking for, you know, um, are you looking for social demographics? Uh, are you looking for more psychological reasons because of this age range? Is it more uh, geology? or, you know, flow of traffic, there, there has to be a foundation. And with that foundation, you will know what has been done before, what has been said before, and what you should be looking at. Um, I want to give a second example, uh, which would be uh, research on parental involvement in children's learning. For example, uh, you are a uh, school guidance counselor, and you would like to do a comparison of how parents are engaged with their children, um, their, with children uh, with or without ADHD. Now, if this research pushes through, it requires a solid theoretical foundation. And um, to give you an example, this would mean you would need literature on children with ADHD. Why are they different? And how are they different from children without? you would need literature on parental engagement with students. And here it's quite complex as well because fathers uh, usually engage different from mothers. It's also a question of are both parents working? There's a socioeconomic consideration here, single parents as well. There's also the question of um, simple capacity and also parental knowledge and also possibly pedagogical styles. So with all of those theoretical foundations, uh, reading through them, bringing them together, you will be able to come up with your theory, your hypothesis, and then you would be able to move forward with your research. For example, after reading through all of these data, all of these uh, journal articles and books, you think that um, per, uh, parents of children with ADHD are more involved in their children's study than those without, and you hypothesize that both mothers and fathers are equally involved in this case than in the average case, wherein normally mothers are more involved because they take over their responsibilities, then that is a very good start. And you can start designing um, your research with that foundation. Um, I add here, but I won't go into it uh, very much, the importance of the theoretical framework according to other scholars. Uh, I highly recommend this scholar. It's been a while. It was published in 1981. But uh, he really lists the different ways of assessing whether a research is a good research based on the theoretical framework. Uh, so please take a look at that uh, if you have the time later on. I wanted to give you some examples of what I mean exactly by theories um, within the different disciplines. And, and here we are. And please note in red, this is not a complete list. These are not all the disciplines in the social sciences. And these are not all the theories within these disciplines. I just wanted to give, um, let's say, a bird's eye view on what is available to you. So I, I only put four because otherwise this would be completely unreadable. And I put some theories from anthropology, sociology, education, international relations. But as you know, we also have political science, we have linguistics, we have psychology, we have so much more. Um, just to give you uh, an example from this table, um, let me see. So for example, uh, in the field of education, Oh, there are many things interesting that I want to say. Um, let's look at the last one, transformative learning theory. <clears throat> so transformative learning theory is a theory of adult learning that utilizes disorienting dilemmas to challenge students' thinking. So this theory uh, theorizes that students, um, when encouraged to use critical thinking and when encouraged to 
question their underlying assumptions and beliefs about the world is how uh, learning happens. So an example of a transformative learning theory is adult learners who initially, uh, during an ex-ante evaluation of the class, say that they do not believe um, that same-sex relationships uh, should be recognized during this class. And uh, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, but based on this theory, during this class, they will be faced with very, very challenging situations. Um, an example is, let's say, um, a same-sex relationship where one partner is hospitalized and is in a coma and has no family and no other resources where the other partner is not being allowed to visit the said partner because the same-sex relationship is not recognized and to show um, the psychological distress that this brings on both the patient and the healthy partner and just to see um, how does this affect um, how does this disorienting dilemma affect the adult learner? Does it change their point of view? Does it maybe add more nuances to that? So that is one theory uh, under education. Um, I wanted to point out as well the flipped classrooms theory because uh, during this time of COVID, uh, I think it's becoming more and more relevant. Uh, the flipped classrooms theory, um, in a nutshell, is where you have... Um, the belief that where you have the teacher having students learn through multimedia while they're at home, uh, for example, through 10 minute videos that the teacher creates or podcasts or so forth, multimedia, and that when they come to the classroom, instead of watching said multimedia, the classroom time is dedicated to in-depth discussion. So imagine, uh, for example, um, that the students commute home and they can take this 30-minute uh, commute, 10 minutes of that, to watch the videos that the teachers create. Uh, when they're at home, they can relax, they can eat snacks, they can help their parents. And then when they come to school the next day, uh, they're able to discuss already with their teachers and their classmates rather than setting up a projector and showing the video and then asking after the video, how was it? So this is another theory. Of course, um, some people disagree with this. There, there are a few reasons why this would not work, including access to communications devices, stable internet, workload of the teacher. All of these theories have um, naysayers, let's say. But, but it's interesting. And it's interesting to think about it. And when you think about it, maybe you automatically think, yeah, that, that sounds really good. Or maybe you think, ah, no, that's going to be an extra 10 hours of work on my work week. It's, it's not really possible. And uh, then I, I also wanted to point out uh, one last thing from this slide. Um, theories, even though they might have the same term, uh, are different under each discipline. So you will see here, I apologize that it's small, but you will see here that there is such a thing as feminist anthropology. Uh, there is also feminist theory in sociology, and there is also a feminist international relations theory. Even though they are all um, under the same umbrella of feminism, the scholars under each discipline use it in different ways tailored to their discipline. So a feminist anthropological scholar will be citing feminist anthropological scholars, possibly some from other disciplines if it's an interdisciplinary study, but mostly from the same discipline. Now, if you are a student, you know very clearly what is your discipline. It's the department that you are enrolled in. It's where your teachers are from. If you are a practitioner, it might be a bit more complex um, to determine what uh, discipline you are doing your research under and which theories you should be working under. And for this, I can only recommend uh, reading through them because once you read through them, you will clearly see whether or not it applies uh, to what uh, particular thing that you are doing. And yes. This brings me to the research methodology. Let us assume that you have found your theory, you are confident in the conversation that you are joining, you are ready to figure out a way to get your data. So the first thing I want to do is to differentiate between a method and a methodology. 
So a method is just a research tool. It's a component of research. For example, it is a survey, it is an interview, it's a data mining or so forth. It's the singular thing. Whereas a methodology is the justification for using a particular research method. So methodology is something that you need to think about as deeply as you think about your theory. It's it's not just something that is selected because it's easy, it's accessible, or it's um, it's what you want to do, but uh, it has to fit in with why you are doing your research and the results of your research. So um, I know that for, for some domains, methodology is just a paragraph, a section in uh, the research proposal. Sometimes it isn't even there. And uh, this, this I'm trying to change because how you do your research is extremely important and it will guide you, especially if you're doing a long-term research, a dissertation, or uh, something similar. So um, let me see. I have two examples here. So the first example is uh, research on the number of unwanted pregnancies in the Philippines between 1987 and 2020. Let's Say this is the research topic that you want to focus on. Um, let's say you are in the field of um, political science, human rights research, and you want to look at the actual numbers of unwanted pregnancies in the Philippines. So here you will probably go with a quantitative research method. Uh, you will probably look at uh, statistics from institutes such as Likhaan or the Goodmacher Institute, who have done research on this since the 1980s. Um, notably, please choose uh, reliable research institutes. So um, if they are international organizations or national government level or trustworthy NGOs, these are usually quite reliable. And uh, based on this, you should already have the statistics that you need uh, to go forward with your research question. Um, normally, for this kind of research, looking at numbers, you do not need to have any qualitative research methods. Um, they could add to your research, but they are not necessary. And I wanted to give another example, just two examples all the time to make sure that we're on the same page. And um, my second example is a research that I was and am still involved in. It's the An Air Relimig project that's ongoing until uh, March 2021. And this project was on the role of religion and religious practices of Catholic migrants in France. And uh, I, I want to give you um, just one example. It, it's a big research with a team of 12. But I want to give you one example, one methodology that we're using within this project. Um, there is a um, major cathedral in Lyon, which is where many, if not all, of the migrants go to because it's it's not such a big city, and this is the it's known as the sanctuary. And in this, uh, imagine a rectangular cathedral. Uh, there are alcoves, different alcoves with different saints, um, including. Um, uh, a saint uh, for the Philippines, we have uh, for the Bahamas, for the Vietnamese, for the Chinese, uh, selected uh, patron saints from each country uh, of uh, common migrants who go to France. And uh, one of the research methods that was done in our project, which, ha which has already finished, is a researcher spent 24 hours in that cathedral over the course of, I cannot remember, I believe it was uh, almost three weeks, uh, just sitting and observing who would come and where would they light the candle. So imagine again this uh, rectangular sanctuary. Which alcove would the candles be lit? At what times? And through this, it, it's original data. It has not been done before. Through this, you're able to extrapolate, um, number one, the, the number of practicing Catholic migrants in the city. Number two, what time do they usually come to the church? And from here, you will know as well, you know, are they working uh, full time? Do they only come in the evening? Do they come maybe in the morning before starting a grueling job? And also in terms of number based on the number of candles. And uh, yeah, so it, it's really, really interesting. And I'm excited to share this research uh, with everyone as soon as it's done. We are currently in the writing phase, so it's quite difficult. But um, yes, so, so just imagine that you, you can be as creative as you want 
with your method and methodology as it works for your research project. So you don't have to be limited to what is traditional. You, you can go with what speaks to you and um, what works for your own research. <clears throat> this brings me to the question of um, qualitative research and quantitative research. So broadly speaking, there are two methods of data gathering. Quantitative research, um, which is there, deals usually with large amounts of data. Um, an example could be data from enti an entire community. For example, all residents of all gated subdivisions in Luzon. Or it could be, um, let's say, the Filipino Chinese community or an institution. For example, all hospitals in Dumaguete City or, you know, um, a group of institutions as well, like all accredited Montessori schools in the Visayas. So it's, it's large um, and based on the amount of data, surveys are often used uh, for the social sciences, at least. And as well now, more recently, we are engaging in data mining, as well as using uh, open source OSINT data sources. A random sampling is commonly used in quantitative research uh, in the old days, my God, in the 1990s. This was done through, for example, if you wanted to do phone surveys, random phone surveys, asking three questions. You would get the yellow pages and you would start flipping through this book and where your finger landed, you would call that number. And now there are better ways of ensuring that sampling is random. Um, and this is an important consideration because if you want a breadth of data, it's, it's quite important not just to send uh, a survey to people that you know or to your family, but to make sure that it reaches the actual um, target group that you want the data to come from. Qualitative data, on the other hand, is more focused on the discovery of depth of knowledge. And this is why sample sizes are usually smaller. Uh, for example, qualitative data is usually gathered through in-depth interviews or ethnographic fieldwork, such as in people's homes or in churches, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. This allows the researcher to really unpack the research questions. So whereas in a survey, you have no contact with your respondent, in an interview, especially a face-to-face -face interview, not a, not a video interview, um, you can feel the room, you can probe more if your respondent shows that they want to share more, and you can stop if you sense that your interview questions are becoming too difficult. Of course, the limitation is that uh, you are only one person and quantitat uh, <clears throat> qualitative research is time consuming and can be emotionally damaging and the social sciences. Imagine, for example, having interviews with victims of sexual trafficking. At a certain point, you are pouring out your own humanity to support your interviewees and uh, many researchers, they're not trained psychologists, they're not, we are not equipped to deal with these situations. And uh, yeah, this is not a risk. Uh, it's not a risk seen in quantitative methods. That said, quantitative methods allow you to sample entire cities, regions, countries. If you are part of a large research group, it can even be global. So the bottom line is that there is no best method the best method is the one that is right for you and that is right for the job. Um, let's see, I've added some useful links. Uh, let me see, where did I put them? Here. I've added some useful links here for further reading, uh, including on the relatively new concept of mixed methods, which takes the best of both quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, this book, it's actually, it's chapter three in the book by Creswell and Clark. It's free to download. So um, please click on that if you want to learn more. Um, I personally like the mixed method approach. Uh, of course, it requires mastery of both quantitative and qualitative, which is also time consuming because you need to make sure that you really understand both and get a mentor who is able to check your work in case you are not an expert. But once it is done, um, the data that you gathered is so rich because you have the quantity 
of, um, of, of the quantitative method and, and you can deepen it and enrich it with the quality of a qualitative method. So I, I do recommend that you check that out. Um, here on the right hand side, there is a book that has not yet been released but will very, very soon be released. It was written and edited by colleagues and friends of mine. And I am not getting any commission for this, but I've seen the draft of the book and I really, really like it. And uh, it's on research methods in the social sciences and A to Z of key concepts. Um, you can Google this and you will be able to see the table of contents on the book and you will see that it is extremely in-depth, much more than what I was able to discuss um, this evening. So uh, click on that as well. Um, if you are a university or a library, you should also be able to order a copy, I think. Um, but please visit the website uh, to learn more about that. This brings me to this next step. You've had your theoretical foundation. You are solidly grounded. You have decided on your methodological framework. You have done it. And now we are in the analyzing the research data section. So um, research cannot end with the data gathering portion. Let's say that you have done these 800 surveys and you have the data. You cannot just publish that data. That is raw data. It has to be interpreted. And what we are looking for when we say the analysis of research data is uh, for you to be able to identify within that data what are the patterns, the trends, uh, the relationships that you can see based on your own um, background, your experience, your view, and the data that you have gathered. And here I want to say um, to use technology wisely. So this totally depends on if uh, you have quantitative or qualitative data, I want to say, because the format of your data is very important. If you have research that has audio, video, or pictures, um, then technology is not really your friend. If, uh, for example, because qualitative data can also become quantitative if you encode it, uh, for example, using um, a program like InVivo or similar, that said, if your qualitative data has multiple languages, for example, um, I have done interviews and in the interviews, my respondents spoke English, Tagalog, Bisaya, Bicolano and French. This was in France in the same interview. It's like Taglish, but uh, 100 times worse. Um, I had the option to use software to, um, to analyze the data for me. However, it would only have worked if they had only spoken one language. Then the software would be able to identify what are the words that were spoken the most often and uh, be able to show me this in graphical format. But as the software cannot understand uh, two, three, four languages, uh, it was not possible to do it. So I had to do the analysis of that data manually. And by manually, I mean with highlighters, pens and post-its. You, you have no choice. I mean, in this case, you have no choice. And uh, as usual, I, I want to give two examples here. One is qualitative and one is more quantitative. Um, the first example is by a colleague and a dear friend, Sheila, who is currently now, um, hmm, where are you, Sheila? With the Ateneo de Cagayan. She's just returned from finishing her PhD in Italy. And she did her research on uh, Filipino youth migrant social rep representations of migratory experiences and multidimensional identities. In short, uh, Sheila asked um, Generation 1.5 migrants to draw their experience. So what was it like in the Philippines? And what was it like when they came to Rome? Draw it, uh, literally to draw on paper. And uh, she was able to interview and to have, I believe, 80 um, children and teenagers do this exercise. And through this exercise and through all of these drawings, uh, she was able to show how the Filipino young migrants thought about their multidimensional identities. How did they represent their migratory experiences? And uh, with the drawings, uh, they were able... Um, 
she was able as well uh, to show you know what are the common threads between it's a very very difficult generation if you grow up in the philippines usually under the care of your grandparents or extended family and then at age a young age or a young teenage age you are um, called to italy to join your mother and your father not having spoken with them except by Viber or Skype for the past unknown number of years. It's a difficult situation to be in for everyone. And uh, Sheila was able to use a creative way and a supportive way um, to get the youth to share their experiences regarding this. Uh, here in the link, I believe you will be able to read more about her research. And um, if I understand correctly, you should also be able to download it uh, there. A second example is uh, a research that was done by Leonardo Morlino, uh, also from Rome. I realize these are both Italian examples. Um, I was very, very fortunate to be able to work with Professor Morlino in 2013 and 2014 on research on the quality of democracy. And this is um, a quantitative research. So very briefly, uh, Leonardo Morlino and Larry Diamond created indicators to show the quality of democracy. Uh, so democracy as a concept is quite vague and many people have many different definitions of democracy. And what they have done is to create a series of uh, eight major indicators with smaller indicators within them to be able to exactly map and assess the quality of democracies of each country based on the quantitative data of the countries. So here in this link under example two, you will be able to see how this was applied to the Asia Pacific region, including the Philippines, as well as what indicators were used and the research method. So if you click on that, or if you Google uh, Leonardo Morlino, Larry Diamond, quality of democracy, you should also be able to see more information. And um, the data is also open source. So if you go to the website, you should also be able to see that data and maybe create your own analysis, whether you agree or not um, with the findings. This brings me now to an important consideration, especially as uh, we are dealing with social sciences. When it comes to ethical considerations, most of this discussion has revolved around human and animal subjects in the natural sciences. So on animal testing, the ethics of that, on human testing, the use of human embryos, and so forth. Now in the social sciences, this is not our concern. We are not doing human or animal testing. But that said, our research can be damaging and we can do harm if they are not designed properly. So for me, ethical considerations is one of the most integral parts of designing a research project. The research participants should not be subjected to harm in any way. There should always be respect for the dignity of the participants. You should have their full consent. They need to be aware that you are talking to them as part of a research. And finally, and I don't mention here, but it is very important, their data has to be protected. If you are doing interviews or surveys or anything of the sort, you gather someone's name, their family background, their, their address and everything, this data is protected. You cannot let anyone else have access to the data. You need to have a secure way of storing anything you have, video, audio recording, and so forth. Um, as a practical example, I don't have it here, but uh, in the photo you see it. If you are doing research on children, let's say you want to know how children interact with, with children of other races, with foreign children or with children of ethnic minorities, you need to make sure that the way your research is designed will not damage these children's psychosocial situation. You need to make sure that the parents of the children are aware and as well if you are not their teacher that the teacher is fully aware of the research. Um, another example is you want to do research on youth. Uh, you want to know whether this flipped classroom situation actually works for them and you come up with a test group and you come up with a control group. And the youth are, let's say, um, around 13 or 14, that age range. 
In this case, you would need to have the consent of the parents, of course, as they are underage, of the teacher, if you are not their teacher, as well as of the youth, because they are of an age that they need to be aware that they are involved in a research study. And for everyone who is able to consent, um, and for the parents of those who are unable to consent, you need to make sure that they are aware that they can withdraw from the study at any time with no consequences, you will delete their data. So these are ethical considerations uh, for research. Um, yes, one more thing. If you are working with vulnerable groups, so let's say um, victims of uh, sexual trafficking, as I mentioned earlier, or victims of domestic violence, or ethnic minorities who have been racially profiled, or just name any vulnerable group. You need to be extra careful. If you are not a trained psychologist and you are going to be talking to victims of rape or victims of violence, you need to make sure that you have received that training because the risk is that you might do more damage to these victims. And I know that this is not the intent of any researcher, but we need to know our limitations. And uh, we need to make sure that we do not hurt anyone in the process of our research. Um, finally, in today's discussion, I wanted to talk about communication and dissemination, which is not usually discussed when talking about the research project, especially when we're still in the design phase and we haven't even done it yet. But because I am... Um, so, so invested in this global conversation of research, I, I wanted to underscore that um, you cannot do research alone and not share it. You, you might be personally satisfied and personally fulfilled, but the research does not reach its maximum potential. It, it, it's not shared with your colleagues. It's, it's not shared with people who might be interested to read it. And if it's not published or shared at all, it will eventually just fade away and no one will know that it has ever been done. And this is such a shame because research, whether your hypothesis is proved or whether it is disproved, all of this data is so important to share and it's so enriching to everyone. So sharing data encourages collaboration, encourages connection, networking. It can, um, it can be the stepstone to new findings. It can be the stepstone to new collaborations, new research. If somebody reads your work and they say, hey, I, I really like what you did, I want to work with you, then that can become an even larger research project. And just to say that, let's say you are a teacher, a social worker, a police officer, and you do your research, and um, a, a policymaker reads it, a politician, a congressman, a senator, and they see exactly what you see on the ground and they read it and it informs what they do. It informs what laws they pass. Uh, it informs what policies they support. And this is research into action. It's research into policy. And, and this is uh, really what we want to go, the direction that we want to go in. I mentioned at the beginning of this seminar that normally people are encouraged to publish in peer-reviewed journals, so scientific publications, and this definitely applies to anybody listening who is an academic because of the publish or perish rule <laughs> or to publish monographs or so forth, but do not be limited to peer-reviewed journals. Sharing doesn't just mean sharing with people with PhDs. Sharing means sharing with anybody who can benefit with your research. And I, I listed a few ways here, and I just want to go through them very briefly. So a way of sharing your research, whether or not you have it written down, even if you're just doing it or planning to do it, is to have an internal workshop with your colleagues or your network. You can schedule one Wednesday every month to have a research sharing day and bring a brown bag lunch. You can all gather around the table. You can eat your lunch. One person discusses what they're doing. Everybody gives feedback. It's very relaxed. It's great. Um, another way, a more formal way, is to have internal professional development afternoons with your institution. Let's say you're a bit more progressed with your research. You already started and you wanted their direct feedback. 
Uh, you can organize mini sessions, uh, invite uh, students, lecturers, external guests, and so forth. You present what you're doing and then they can give you your, their feedback directly. Of course, we have national and international conferences on every topic in the social sciences. Um, especially now with COVID-19, these are now all webinars. I know that, especially in the case of the Philippines, many of these conferences are usually done in Manila or in Cebu or in Davao more recently, but usually in these uh, three major cities. And it's very inaccessible for people who are coming from other regions to, you know, if you want to present 30 minutes, you need to fly to Manila, find a hotel, stay there for the night, go present in the morning, leave again, go back to your work, you've left your work, you've left your family. Believe me, I understand. And uh, that means that uh, for many um, conferences that are taking place in person, we are limited to the people who are already around us or who have a lot invested into it. But now with uh, COVID-19, uh, it's a really unfortunate situation, but looking at the silver lining, we are now holding more and more online webinars such as this one. Um, I believe that there will be more and more um, online national and international conferences, especially this year. And it's, it's an opportunity. So it's an opportunity to listen to other presentations and an opportunity to present your own research. Um, this brings us as well to academic publications in peer-reviewed journals or monographs or so forth. Please, please do. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the highest ranked ways of sharing your information uh, through a peer review process. And once this is done, um, these are usually, uh, how to say it? They're usually more accessible, permanently accessible, because, for example, if you hold an internal workshop or you attend a conference, usually the proceedings are not shared uh, globally or at all. Uh, whereas if you publish in a recognized peer review journal, especially if it is open source, then anybody can have access to your research and um, that will get it uh, shared a great deal. Uh, following this, you can also write opinion articles, also known as white papers. You can write these for independent newspapers, for actual newspapers, or for websites. You can also write policy papers and recommendations. These would be targeted directly to our uh, politicians and decision makers. And of course, you know, be, be creative. Uh, you can also do blogs, podcasts, use social media if you're being particularly artsy, uh, make your own infographics. You know, knowledge knowledge should be shared and uh, it should be accessible to all. So there are many, many ways that you can do it and uh, just go with what makes you comfortable. Uh, if you need to publish, then, well, you need to publish. So go with that as well. And um, just don't limit yourself to any one of these items. Uh, yes, so what do you do if you need help? If at the end of this session you are lost, I am sorry. Uh, <laughs> I hope that you can go back to the recording and uh, maybe find what aspect was confusing. And you can ask me about it or uh, you can ask any of your colleagues about it, especially researchers. If you are close to a university or a library, uh, those are also great resources. If you are confused about any specific item, um, maybe you want to know more about the theories in your field, uh, you want to know more about how to design a survey, a good survey, um, then again, don't hesitate to reach out to, to the experts, to um, professors and researchers at the universities, to librarians, um, even, you know, uh, those of us who are abroad, we are here to help. So mm, do not hesitate at all. Please reach out. Um, another question is, what if you can't get access to articles? This is a very good question, especially if you're not affiliated to a university. Many journals are, um, they're locked, they're paid access. And uh, who wants to pay $30 for one journal article that you can read for three days? It, it's, um, it's not possible. And in this case, again, reach out. So um, there are many, many groups on Facebook and on WhatsApp and even on Viber specifically for this purpose. So I am part of one called Orpheus. It's the um, 
oh my god what does it stand for the organization of filipino students in europe i think it means and uh there on our facebook group if we encounter a paywall so we, we see an article that we want we need it we realize that our university or our research institute does not have access to it we post it on that facebook group and normally within 30 seconds somebody replies somebody who has access replies and they send you the actual article and um th this is this is by any hand uh, in action because we, we help each other if we have access we will give it um another question is uh, you've maybe designed the research proposal or you've done a couple of chapters and you want some feedback share it with your colleagues share it with your supervisor share it with us the random strangers and um, if we have time we will definitely definitely give you feedback and if we don't have time normally we will refer you to someone else if you have a question that you want to present your research you have been inspired by me and my presentation today but you don't know where aha here google is your friend uh, you can Google, for example, conference alerts. It will show you, this is more international though, but it will show you all of the upcoming conferences for the next 10 years, where they are, how to register. Uh, if you know your specific topic, you can also use any search engine to do that and see what is upcoming. Uh, maybe more senior people in your field are more aware and they, they just haven't had the chance to share what they know, ask them, and they might recommend a specific conference. Uh, that's coming up uh, finally you want to publish but you don't know how mm, i also have a problem here it's also a limitation for me uh, but in this case you know you ask ask those who have already published before ask uh, the publishing houses themselves ask the editors google as well is your friend so the bottom line here is that if you need help do not hesitate to ask do not suffer alone research is beautiful i love it but it is also hard and there are many steps and uh, if you're doing research for the first time or if you're doing research for the first time after a long long time then it might get a bit confusing some things have changed including you know automatic citation we have that now uh, open citation is also a thing speaking of citation um, please uh, when doing research always remember when an idea is not yours, when an item is not yours, cite. Uh, it doesn't take anything away from your idea. It shows that you know what is yours and you know what you are building it out of. And this applies to everything, including PowerPoints. Um, if you notice, every single image and quotation in this PowerPoint has a little citation at the bottom of where it is from, whether it is Creative Commons or no attribution needed. And um, it's just a small thing, but if you do it regularly, it will become more and more natural also when writing. Um, so this is actually the end of my presentation. My goal at the start of this session was just to make sure that everyone knows that research is accessible. You can do research if you want to. People want you to do research. And um, hopefully to inspire some of you if you haven't done it in a long time or if you are only starting now to please, please do start. I'm really excited to see what can come out of this, especially from everyone uh, working on the ground, from our next generation of students. Um, you, you are there, you have access. I don't know if you have time. This is one of the biggest challenges that I did not mention in this presentation, but I want to acknowledge now at the end, um, in the case of research, time is really one of the most challenging concepts and money. Let's not talk about that now. Let's talk about time first. Um, in my case, I am a full-time nonprofit project manager with a baby. Uh, working from home during the coronavirus pandemic if you imagine my time it's it's like smoke it's, it's just gone and uh, what's happening is that research at least for me because it's it's not my main um it's not my employment actually it's what i do because i'm passionate about it it falls to the background because one you need to do your job you need to earn money 
the two, or that should be one, actually one, you need to take care of your family, you need to make sure they're fed, they're healthy. And um, for many of us, we have extended family, we have elderly relatives, we have young children, and then of course we have our own work, which if you are listening to this seminar is probably not focused on research. And then you have research, which is, which is on top of all of that. But it is worth it. Um, it is inspiring. I, I am still trying to figure out my own personal way forward on how to make sure that I continue to do my research, I continue to share, and that I can continue to support everyone who wants to do it. Um, you will see also there my email address. When I say that uh, I am here to help, I was not just saying it. One of my advocacies is to make sure that um, everybody who wants to do further education, graduate education abroad is supported. And with that, I am a member of uh, Campus Erasmus, Mus uh, Erasmus Mundus, who is supporting uh, Filipino students to get scholarships abroad, especially those who do not have access to such scholarships. And in relation to this, now that I am working a lot with uh, Filipino migrant workers, I really want to make sure that everyone's potential is reached in as much as my capacity. If it is out of my capacity, I will direct you to someone uh, who can do it better than me. So um, this is all for me today. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Um, I know that there are a few questions, so I will do my best to answer those. And um, I hope you have a very, very lovely evening. And um, bye-bye.